Hi, <laughs> Haz. Enjoy your channel. When will you get more 2X shirts in? Do you have any idea? That's from William. Um, you know, William, we might have some in now. I got to double check. I know we have double. I'm pretty sure we have double XL. Um, I'll have to ask Stephen, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that we do have double XL. Okay, so I'll, obviously I'm going to wait. We'll let some people join before we get into the topic at hand. Um, as always, I'm just going to kind of cover the news uh, that uh, needs to be covered. So just so you guys know, I know if you follow me, you probably already know, but I have to say this again and again just to remind people. Um, Woodstock location is open. So if you, you're looking for dog training close to Woodstock, Ontario, we have a location there. It is now open. Very nice training facility. Um, our Toronto location is at about a week away from being open. So we are going to have a location in central Toronto, 1110 DuPont Street in Toronto. Um, so anybody in Toronto looking uh, to get uh, dog training behavior modification or functional obedience classes, uh, we will have a spot there as well. Um, in other news, our brand new uh, facility here at uh, Shield Canine HQ is under construction as well. Um, and uh, that 7,200 square foot facility uh, should hopefully be done in time for Christmas. So fingers crossed, really hoping it's, uh, it's going to work out. And uh, we're going to have a nice new place to train in this winter because it is going to be a cold winter. Let's see here. Okay. Getting some more people in here. So again, guys, I'm not going to start the topic at hand until uh, we have got. Hey, how's it going, on Canine German Shepherd? Um, until we have got uh, enough people in here, and uh, then I'll start the uh, the topic that this is uh, this live is going to be primarily about. I like to do that with lives. You know, I I like to do question and answer, uh, but then I like to talk about a specific topic and then maybe some periphery stuff as well. Let's see here. Joanna Maria. Hey, has quick question. Could you shortly explain how to start with a six month old puppy who had any training before? It's a lab. I like to start power obedience, starting with regular obedience. Power obedience is our, our competition course. So she's talking about our online courses. Power obedience is our competition obedience course. So unless you're interested in perform in doing competition with your dog or having fun with your dog, um, you know, just to train behaviors like that for fun, it's not really functional. Uh, it's not going to help you in any capacity with like um, your pet. So if you if you want, you know, just a well-behaved pet that listens to you, you take our elite off-leash obedience course. I've trained many, many dogs that, you know, are like two, three, four years old with zero formal training in the past. It makes no difference. Um, you know, you just get started and you train the dog. Let's see here. Hey, from Morocco. Hey, man, how are you? Turn the aquarium lights out. It's stressful to Jax. Who's Jax? There's no fish in here. <laughs> well, actually, there is one fish. I put a test subject in there just to make sure that the uh, the water is uh, the the water is good. I put my least favorite cichlid in there, so he's he's testing the waters, so to speak. Let's see here. I have a great day who is reactive to other dogs. I have trouble controlling him. Well, good news, ragdoll pet grooming. Um, many great days are reactive because they are insecure dogs. Um, we have a reactive dog course that is designed to help you deal with that problem. And uh, you can check out our online courses at shieldk9.ca. K9 German Shepherd asks, how did you pick the name Shield K9 for your business? Cool name. Um, I wanted a, a name. I've, I've always been interested in protection training, protection dogs. Um, so what's more protective than a shield, right? So you put those two things together, you got Shield K9. Uh, let's see here. Maddie Kyle, uh, this is... Um, from our elite members group. Have you seen the post on Facebook on Seal? Yes, I have seen that post. Um, so we can talk a little bit about it when we get into the topic, dealing, uh, training dangerous dogs. Um, and then we'll go from there. 
So Alan asks, <laughs> I could open the first Shield Canine in USA, the franchise. Well, Alan, I've been following your progress on the Elite Members Group. It's looking pretty good, my friend. So maybe we'll see how she goes, my. We'll see how she goes. Um, Thomas asks, what do you like about Mace, your Dutch Shepherd? What do I like about him? He's a little something different. Um, it's been a while since I trained a Dutchie um, for anything more than pet obedience. Um, you know, he's a dog that has an upside. You know, a lot of the time with the Dutchies, and the, the problem with them is that you've got to wade through all the, the crap and all the, you know, behaviors and all the, the stuff that they do um that they commonly do but there's no upside because it's just a pet dog and you know there's really not a lot of working capacity there mace does have quite a nice upside you know he's he's got really nice grips uh, you know i think he's a strong dog in the bite work uh, you know there's there's a working function for him so if you're able to optimize uh your relationship with the dog and put some real control on the dog um you know there's there's a lot of upside to, to mace and and i'm i look forward to being able to bring that out it's kind of like if you find like a diamond in the muddy ground and you take that diamond out and you polish it and you cut it and you polish it until it's something beautiful that's what i see in mace and, and that's what i'm going to uh enjoy doing with him is, is bringing out his potential hey guys how's it going i see you all here um training dangerous dogs is a bit personal as a trainer intern at a facility i've had to watch a german shepherd malmix almost get put down for sporadic dog aggression i want to learn dog aggression isn't something generally most people put a working dog down for um you know usually it's 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 um it's it's a human aggression or, or handler aggression that gets gets a lot of dogs put down um you know dog aggression generally is something that you know you can manage your way through especially with a working dog Hey, has any advice on starting a working dog breeding kennel? My plan is to import a female from overseas with titles and breed with um, my dog. I'm working on titling now. What makes you think your dog is a stud dog? That's what I always say to people. You know, I'm real harsh with the breeding because a lot of people do it without spending really like they, 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 they want to do that as like one of the first things that they do. It's like, no, spend some years actually training and, and titling and going on the field and testing your dogs and testing your training, testing your understanding of what a good dog really is, the qualities of what a good dog really is. It takes years to really understand that. So until you can see colors, it's probably not a good idea to try and become an artist, right? Um, so that's my advice to people. You know, if you think you're going to make money breeding working dogs, especially if you're not really a... a uh, a person that is well known in the working community and you don't have a good customer base i've seen a lot of people go and do a breeding and then they're sitting on these puppies for six to eight months you know it's a bad idea don't do it you know and then a lot of people they have like a male puppy or something they're training I, they go and buy a female to breed to that it's like why your, your dog the chances of your dog being a stud dog is like one in a thousand maybe one in a million stud dogs are few and far between you know it's 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 very easy to find a stud dog <laughs> it's not so easy to find a good female right so it's one of those things where i never suggest you breed working dogs unless you really really know what you're doing because the chances of you um the chances of you coming out with anything good are, are are slim to none okay let's see here i'd like to hear about how best to safely handle serious dogs prior to being able to form a relationship with them such as during initial transport well good news we're kind of covering that in our YouTube series on Mace. All right, guys. So I'm going to get into the, the topic at hand and I'll kind of get back to the question. So the topic at hand is how to train truly dangerous dogs. Okay. So here's the thing you have to understand. Very few dogs are dangerous all the time. Um, you know, there's, there's dogs that are very contextual about when they become dangerous. Um, you know, and there are a few dogs I would say that are truly capable of being dangerous um you know there there's there's certainly a few dogs that that are that have that capability but it's very contextual and that's what a lot of people don't understand um i think again even when you say i don't anthropomorphize dogs and i don't humanize <laughs> dogs many people accidentally do that right and the reality is most human beings you deal with 
if you know them, if you're friendly with them, you share you share time, space, resources with them, you know, you consider them your friend and they act in a friendly and affectionate way towards you, you're going to assume that they have good intentions all the time and you're going to trust them. Now, of course, with human beings, that's not that's not always a safe thing to do, but with dogs, it's certainly, especially a dog that you don't really, really know, it's certainly not a safe thing to do, right? And a lot of people get caught up because they see that the dog actually is happy to see them. The dog wags his tail. I've seen, I can't tell you how many dogs I've seen that truly love the handler. They love their handler. They, they don't want to be without their handler. Um, you know, they wag their tail when they see the handler. You know, they want affection from the handler. But if certain contextual things occur, they will put the handler in hospital and have done so. People don't understand that about dogs. Dogs are very contextual creatures. Certain contexts create emotion in the dog and that emotion creates the proclivity towards certain behaviors. And people really don't, like unless you've seen it a lot, it's like I can tell it to you, but it's kind of hard to understand. So for instance, um, let's talk about uh, duchies, okay? So uh, one thing I've seen a lot of duchies do, not all of them, but a lot of them is they can be great once they know you. You take them out of the kennel. You know, they're friendly with you. They'll work with you. You can do whatever you wanted to do from a training perspective. The second you put them back in the kennel or the crate, they go in and right away they can turn around and come for you. Very common problem I see with duchies. Um, you know, whether it's a, a kind of like the resource guarding of the space. I think a lot of the time it's that they're a little bit frustrated maybe to go back in the kennel. That Maybe they want to stay out. Um, but I've seen a lot of that kind of kennel aggression or crate aggression behavior, and they'll nail you, you know, <laughs> they'll nail you if you're not careful. And people do, but he was just my buddy, you know, he was wagging his tail, he was happy, he was eating my food, he was playing with my ball, he was playing fetch with me, we were doing all this stuff together, and all of a sudden I take him back in the kennel, and now he's turning around and he's nailing me, you know, very common behavior. You see it, you know, the one that I think most anybody can identify with is resource guarding. How many pet dogs do we see come to us for resource guarding behavior? And they bite family members who they normally love. But the second that context of, okay, there's a bowl of food down on the ground now. Well, now there's no more love, you know? And here's the thing. Context isn't set in stone. Context can slowly evolve. So maybe first it's, okay, I'm eating this food and someone comes within, I don't know, a meter. Now the context that, that triggers my aggression has been tripped. And now I'm going to be aggressive. And then it becomes, okay, I'm eating my food and you're two meters away. Now I'm going to be aggressive. Then it's like, hey, I see you put food in a bowl. I'm going to be aggressive right then and there. Hey, we're going into the room where I eat. Okay, I'm going to be aggressive right then and there. The dogs quickly, especially certain dogs, will expand the boundaries of what elicits the aggressive behavior. And if you don't kind of understand this and you're not prepared for this, it can be very, very disconcerting. Um, and, and that's the biggest thing about working with aggressive dogs is don't trust them. I've seen a lot of trainers. I've done it myself. And, you know, I've seen trainers that work for me do this where they trust the dog a little bit too soon because things have been going well for a while. And the dog's been showing you a lot of really good body language. And all of a sudden, certain things line up from a contextual standpoint in terms of occurrences, uh, environmental things, whatever. And the dog suddenly goes off and, you know, tries to hurt you or actually does hurt you. And people really don't understand that. So the key with dangerous dogs, when you train a dangerous dog, okay, or a dog that's capable of being dangerous, you know, there, like I said, there's few dogs that are just generally dangerous. But when you train, you have to first, if you can, if you know the history of the dog, that should give you some hint or some clue as to what the context that elicits the aggression is, Okay. Then the other thing, you have to understand a little bit about the breed of the dog. Let's talk, okay, about a horrific experience that occurred um, very recently in the United States. And it seems unfortunately like this just keeps happening over and over again. You hear about it, um, you know, two pit bulls living with a family, young couple, two young children, okay? They had these dogs for like six, eight, eight years, something <laughs> like that. So it's not like they just got these dogs, right? The dogs obviously were trusted and loved members of the family. All of a sudden, the dogs, for what I didn't really read the story just because I didn't want to get into the details. To be honest, I'm a parent, so this kind of stuff makes me sick. And I've, like I said, I've seen it too many times, right? Especially with the pities. Um, the dogs, uh, 
ended up killing the two children and, and putting the mother in the hospital. Right? They had these dogs, what is it, six, eight years? And, and this happens, right? How does that happen? Well, if you understand the breed, you understand there are certain things, arousal, noises, movements, certain things that can line up that will trigger the behavior that you are you know, trying to avoid or that you don't know to avoid because you haven't seen what can happen. And in many cases, people miss the danger signs, right? So with the pities, for instance, arousal is always the biggest danger, okay? When they become excited, they're much more likely to do a bad thing. And what people think of as aggression is often not, okay? What most of you think of as aggression is actually a bluff. You're thinking about the dog with his teeth out and he's making a big scene and he's super noisy. You had blah, 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 all that shit. It, now, don't get me wrong. That type of dog can still be aggressive. But the chances of that dog doing the same type of damage as the dog that appears excited, okay, doesn't make that much noise. Very forward. Very different. That is a very different type of dog. And the type of damage that, that the excited, happy appearing, hyper aroused dog is going to do is significantly more than the dog who, you know, is making the big scene. The dog who's making the big scene, 99% of those dogs, they're making that scene just like the guy who's blah, 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 blah at the bar. They're making that scene because they don't really want the smoke. The dogs that don't make a lot of noise, that are a little bit more high pitched, that you know, the tail is up, they're pulling, ah, ah, ah. you know, they're showing that really forward, excited, hyper intense behavior. That's the dog that puts you in the hospital or God forbid kills somebody, right? And, you know, it's, it's kind of like a, it's, it's basically a form, oftentimes it's a form of kind of like a prey aggression. They perceive, it, it's non-classical prey, right? So they, 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 they perceive humans maybe as, as prey, um, they perceive, you know, small children as prey. And listen, prey behaviors are not noisy. It's counterproductive for a prey to, for a dog who's in prey to be noisy. Because how's he going to get his prey if he's making all the noise? No, the dog is going to be low and 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 fast and uh, or depending on what he's doing, stalking or you know, he's not making a lot of noise because the goal is to close with the prey, grab the prey, shake the prey, tear the prey apart, eat the prey. Right <laughs> now, of course. Most dogs don't act out the entire sequence of prey, right? They'll go up to, I'll grab it, or they'll go up to, I'll grab it and rip it up, rip it up a little bit, and then I'm done. Very few of them will actually eat it, right? So, but you guys get my, get, get what I'm saying here. There is a lot, I have to be careful what I say here, because people are going to take it the wrong way. There's a lot of you on here that watch me that have bullies and pit bulls. I know, I know. They're not the same. They kind of, they're, they're, they have similar lineage, like, okay, so I know bullies are not game bred pit bulls. Um, they've got the mastiffs in them. They've got the bulldogs in them. They've got other stuff. But at the end of the day, I see a lot of very similar type behaviors. You know, people get, people get confused because they see these dogs and they're so sweet and they're so, like, pit bulls and bullies, they are some of the sweetest dogs to the hammer. The sweetest dogs, like, so cuddly and cute and wonderful. But those, these dogs, there are some of these dogs, obviously a small percentage, but enough of them out there that have those triggers in them, left over from their, you know, ancestors that actually were in the ring and did fight for a living. And, and that was the basis under which they were bred and they were line bred for that specific purpose. Those triggers are in there. And, you know, there's a lot of nonsense being, let's say, professed about these dogs where yeah you know they're they're nanny dogs or they they're only aggressive towards other dogs they're not aggressive towards people or bullies aren't pit bulls they're they're completely different it's like no they're not um i've trained pit bulls i've trained game bred pit bulls and i've trained bullies and yeah there's often a difference in the level of intensity that those dogs can have and you certainly see some bullies that you know definitely don't carry that same dog aggression but i also see look i'm a dog trainer so obviously i'm not seeing all the great ones but at the same time i often see that dog aggression many bullies carry dog aggression and um, some of those bullies have gone from the dog aggression over to the human aggression um you know or they just have that human aggression it's it's not a joke. Like those triggers can be in there and it can be in there in a dog that is extremely 
social and stable appearing. But if certain things line up, you know, let's say, you know, the, the dog's great with the kids, but now the kids are getting a little older and they're able to move a little faster and maybe one of the kids, you know, falls down or starts screaming and the other kid gets involved and they get into a little bit of a wrestling match. Now there's a lot of activity and there's a lot of high-pitched noises and maybe mom comes running and bam, those dogs just, the arousal gets to that point where all of a sudden it's got to go somewhere. And, and, you know, tragedies occur. So when you're dealing with dogs like that, you have to understand what triggers are. You have to understand the dog that you're dealing with, right? Um, and you have to take precautions and set yourself up for success, right? There are certain circumstances with certain dogs, for instance, where, you know, the way that you want to live with that dog, there's not going to be a success, right? Like the, the living situation that you have, the life that you have in mind for you and the dog, it's just not going to work. There's, there's not going to be any success there um, for that specific dog. And then there's many instances in which, look, you want to take this dog, you want to train this dog, or you want to live with this dog, you have to always set the stage. And this is what, what people don't understand, is you must prepare your field of battle. Okay, Every time you train that dog, I don't care how nice the dog is, I don't care how friendly the dog is. If I know that a dog is, let's say I have a dog in for handler aggression, very common, right? He redirects on the handler when he gets frustrated or, you know, he does X or Y or Z or whatever the contingencies are for him to be aggressive. I'm always ready for him to be aggressive. I never assume, well, he seems happy today. He's wagging his tail. I'm ready for him to be aggressive. I've got my tools in place. I know if he's aggressive, this is what I'm going to do. I'm watching him. In some cases, I'll even try to set him up, right? And, and, and elicit that behavior so I can create some aversion around that behavior, right? So preparation is key when you're working dogs that are either you know they're dangerous or they're potentially dangerous. The second you start kind of flying by the seat of your pants, that's generally when things go wrong. I've never really had something go wrong on me when I was ready for it and expecting it to go wrong. Nine times out of 10 is when you're not expecting it, when you're not prepared, and when you're taking things for granted. Okay, now let's talk about, okay, you've got an aggressive dog or a dog you think may be aggressive or has the potential to be aggressive. How do you build a relationship with that dog? Well, I've got to say, every dog needs a person. Even the nastiest dogs I've run into, they need somebody. I've met maybe one or two dogs in my life that just plain didn't like anybody, but the vast majority of them, even the nastiest dogs, they need somebody in their life. So guess what? We go to a system where all the resources come from the person, from, from you. So I assume you're the one who's trying to make, make a relationship with this dog. All the resources come from you, okay? So food, water, everything comes from you. And the dog learns when he sees you, good things are going to happen. Now, of course, if you have a kennel or something, like I don't like to do this in a crate with a serious dog. I mean... You can, but it's it's risky. I like to use a kennel. You can set up a four by four kennel in your garage. You can buy the kennel panels. It's not hard, right? Um, and because it gives you a little more space to move with the dog, and you see more of the dog's behavior when they're in a crate and they're kind of back in the back in the corner or something like that. You're reaching in there. It's a dangerous deal, right? Um, I prefer using kennels for dogs like that. I don't like to to have them in crates. Now, um, in the beginning, like I said, it's a resource game. I provide resources, so why wouldn't he be happy when he sees me, even if he's not happy right off the hop? You guys can see this, so I'm about to release tonight, after I'm done this live, I'm going to release the first video of me and Mace, okay? Um, and uh, so Mace is, for those of you that don't know, he's a new Dutch Shepherd I bought in Europe. I saw him, he was a really nice dog from a bite work perspective, and I said, you know what? <laughs> I, uh, I need a little bit of a challenge. I need a dog to have a little bit of fun with outside of IGP uh, because, you know, I don't have enough on my plate, right? So I bought Mace, um, and he's almost three years old, and he's a lot of dog, um, you know, and, and he's a big dog and a strong dog, and, um, you know, I, I, I can see that there's, there's, there's a lot of working potential on the dog, but he's also out of control, and he's a dog that when he arrived here, he certainly did not appear happy to be in a new place, we're happy to be dealing with new people. He was showing a lot of crate aggression, um, you know, in the kennel. He was showing uh, aggression towards anyone that would approach the kennel. 
And he's not a dog I take chances with just because I know what he can do from a bite work perspective. He's large and I've dealt with enough Dutchies to be careful with them, right? So um, Mace is my new Dutch Shepherd. So I decided, you know what, I'm going to film this whole process of me basically um, making a relationship with him and ultimately training him. And um, I'll just release them in episodes, basically. And then you guys can kind of see what I'm doing with Mace um, on a week-to-week basis. I'm sure it'll be interesting for some of you. So after this, after I'm done this live, I will release that. So anyways, yes, as I was saying, so I know one guy. I'm not going to say his name, obviously. Um, uh, German trainer. Uh, and he was telling me, you know, with, with aggressive dogs, like with the really aggressive dogs, one thing he liked to do, and it made sense, no water, no food nothing and for the first few days couple days no water it's a rough go well guess what i don't do this by the way i don't do the no water thing because nine times out of ten it's not my dog and i don't i don't do the the no water thing i don't even really do the no food thing if it's not my dog like i i feed all the dogs obviously if it's if it's not my dog i don't i don't ever withhold food they get the their their food in training and they get their food at in a bowl every day but anyways so let, back to this little thing and I'm, I'm going to talk about the no water thing because i think it was a very interesting idea so what he does is um, uh he pours the water in his hands and he holds it out to the dog and if the dog shows aggression no water my friend try again tomorrow then you hold the water out again and you pour it in your hand and when the dog's willing to lick it out of your hand well now he sees you as a source of life right food is different like dog can go for a long time without food I've seen dogs intentionally not eat for a week, right? Obviously not your average dog, but I've seen met, I've seen dogs do that. Food, water is a different thing. Water is life. You cannot go for any length of time without water. And after a period of time, it's, it's something that I don't care what kind of dog you are, what kind of animal, what kind of human you are, you will do anything for that water. So the water was what he was using to get to the dogs. But at the end of the day, it's all the same concept. I control resources. I control food, I control water, I control space, I control everything. So why wouldn't you like me? Because every time you see me, I'm giving you something, okay? So that's one. Number two, when you take the dog out, again, how are you taking that dog out of the kennel? What is your preparation, right? What is What, are, what tools are you putting on the dog, whether it's a, a slip lead, whether it's a, a, a e, I would I don't ever use e-collars for dogs like this, especially in the beginning, just so you know, um, whether it's a pinch collar or a choke, whatever it is. What are you using? What's your go-to plan? You know, for, <laughs> what's your go-to plan if, if shit hits the fan, right? A lot of people don't, don't think this through. And then you'll go through what I call, once you get over that initial hump, you'll go through the honeymoon phase, okay? Dog's always happy to see you. Dog's always acting comfortable. He's acting friendly. He's doing things. You start to feel confident. Oh, look at me. I'm Mr. Badass or Miss Badass Trainer. I'm so great with dogs. They all love me. You know, I'm the dog whisperer, reborn, reincarnated, blah, blah, blah. And then next thing you know, you've lined yourself up for a mauling because now Fluffy is comfortable. And when Fluffy gets comfortable, things get dangerous, especially when those things that we discussed earlier, when certain specific environmental and um, behavioral contexts fall into place. Okay, he got excited. So for instance, one thing you'll see with the duchy that I'm handling, when I first get him out of the kennel, um, when I first take him out of the kennel, he got really excited because I could tell his life has been leave the kennel, do work, okay, right? And, and probably like bite work primarily, and then go back in the kennel. So he left the kennel and right away, he saw some people, he started thinking bite work and, he, and you know, barking and hyper aroused and blah, blah, blah. That's a, that's a danger, right? Because at that point, he's in a state of arousal. When he's aroused, he's more like, there's less of a cognition going on there. There's much more likely for there to be something going wrong, right? Where the dog, maybe he's really aroused, pointing in one direction, and then you kind of pull on him and he turns around, sees you, and bang, he smokes you. Right? Just because it's not because he didn't really think about it, it's just because that's what happened. Because he was aroused and that energy had to go somewhere. Right. And there's a lot of dogs that I see that get into like a lot of police dogs, a lot of sport dogs, they actually get into the habit of redirecting their energy on the handler. And it's something that they've done a few times and they learned they could get away with it. And they learned that it was an acceptable way to deal with that arousal. And they get into doing that. And unless you have a plan, okay, I know he's a redirector. Let me set him up. 
let me deal with this redirection, either block the behavior or actually punish the behavior, right? So controlling resources, setting the playing field in your favor, setting yourself up to win, okay? And then having a go to hell plan. Okay, he's bitten me. What's my backup? Am I a 120 pound lady working with a 100 pound dog by myself? Probably not. Look, if I'm working with a 120 pound dog that I think is dangerous, I'm not by myself. Hey, buddy, whoever's working with me, hey man, I'm gonna be working this dog. Just have the, you know, have the catch pull or whatever in case you need to snub him up if he grabs me or something like that, right? Like, you got to have a plan if things go to hell. <laughs> Carry a weapon on you if you have to, you know. But people have been killed by dogs. There are some dogs out there that will literally kill your ass, right? You know, I remember I worked with one client. She was like probably like 110 pounds, okay? She's a little slight girl. And she had this 120-pound press mix and he was like a dominant dog. Like there was no fear in him. And if she tried to make him do anything, he would literally go after her and grab her. He put her in the hospital a time or two. And um, so they started putting him in a muzzle and we had started training with him. And um, so he would wear a muzzle. He was never bad in training, but at home, if she tried to do anything like, hey man, like you gotta get off the couch or you gotta go over there or, if, if he even didn't like the way she looked at him, he'd come for her. So even in the muzzle, I remember once she came to training, she had all these like scratches like all around her leg and her arms because he had a muzzle on. So he was muzzle punching her, but he couldn't get to her. So what he was doing was he was wrapping her up with his paws. And, you know, they have the dew claw, right? So he was just scratching her all over her legs and her arms because he wrapped her up and he was muzzle punching her and trying to maul her to death. Right? If she, if she, if he hadn't been wearing the muzzle, she probably would have died. I told her, hey, look, I don't think this is the dog for you. Uh, either give him away or put him down. And I don't know who you're going to give him to, so you might have to give him the blue juice. Unfortunately, like he's he's trying to kill you, you know, and and you're not physically built to prevent him from doing that if he really wants to. So it's one of those things, you know. Sometimes, like I said, that that falls into that category of hey, you probably can't set the the battlefield up the training field, the playing field up for victory in that circumstance, for a good outcome. It's going to end poorly for you, right? So that's the other thing. Here's the other thing you need to understand. Certain types of dogs, like the Mallies, the Dachis, they're very pattern-based, okay? They, they are very pattern-based. So like, for instance, when I've got, when I'm dealing with a Malwa that's really bit somebody, not like a little bite, like I mean like somebody went to the hospital, okay? He opened somebody up. When I'm dealing with a Malwa that's done that, especially if he's done it more than once, I know there's a very high likelihood that the neurotic little bastard or big bastard, depending on who I'm dealing with, is going to try to do the same thing to me under certain circumstances. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to hunt that behavior. I'm going to hunt it down. I'm not going to let it creep up on me and ambush me. I'm going to try to hunt it down so I can create some inhibition there, right? There's this idea out there that um, a number of trainers perpetuate, and I disagree with them. I mean, if it works for them, it works for them. But for me, there's a, you cannot punish um, uh, a mindset or an emotion in a dog, right? Like he feels that way. You can't punish him out of it. No, I can't punish him out of how he feels. That's very true. What I can punish him out is uh, out of is how what he does with his feelings. So let's say I'm a grumpy guy, and I walk around and I'm grumpy. I know people that know me are like, oh, yeah, let's pretend has, okay? So let's pretend I'm a grumpy guy. And I walk around, I'm grumpy. And I say, you know what? I'm a grumpy guy. Anytime I'm grumpy, if I run across somebody and I feel like it, if I'm, if I'm feeling bad enough, I'm just going to clock them right in the head. I'm just going to ball up my fist. And if they get within X distance of me, I'm just going to wind up and they're getting it right in the face. Now, let's say one day I run into the wrong guy. Maybe he's even smaller than me. And I clock him. Maybe I run into Lucas, okay? And I don't know, you know, he's kind of a, a short, chunky guy. So I don't know. I don't know any better. I ball up my fist and I clock him right in the face. And God have mercy on me, he beats me within an inch of my life. Now, do you think, do you think I'm going to do that again? Now, maybe if I'm a psychopath, I might try it once or twice more, right? But at some point, there's going to be a level of inhibition on me where I'm like, this guy might not be the guy. And then let's say 
that Lucas said, you know what, Has I don't trust you. You're not safe in society. I'm going to follow you around. And anytime you do that to somebody, you're going to hear from me. Well, God damn, Lucas is here. I better be good, right? You see how it goes? So I don't care. I feel a certain way, and it makes me do certain things that are dangerous, okay? Now I've created, there's been an inhibition created about how, what I'm doing with my feelings. Now dogs are interesting because we talk about creating true change in the dog. You got to change how they feel in order to create, to create true change. And that's true, right? If you just punish a bad behavior, like, you know, reactive aggression or, um, you know, dominance or dominance aggression or wh whatever type of aggression you're dealing with. If you just punish it and you leave it at that, nine times out of 10, the behavior will resurface over and over and over again. What effectively punishing a behavior does is it gives you a space now. Okay, you've created a breathing space. Now you have a, an empty space there and you can fill it with productive things. Counter conditioning, uh, you know, training alternate behaviors, so on and so forth. So now the dog has something to do with himself, structured play, whatever, whatever. If you don't punish that behavior and, and you know, that the dog will always have that contingency in their mind to revert to, right? And there's no inhibition there. There's no inhibition there. And that's one thing that people don't understand. So I'll give you an example. There was a duchy that we had named Danger, okay? And I named him Danger the second I met him because I said, God damn, you're a little bit dangerous, my friend. And Danger was an a-hole. So uh, we were doing bite work with Danger. And uh, one of my trainers at the time, Carson actually, was handling Danger. And thinking back, back I, I was a bad guy. I should not have set him up. I didn't know that. I should have known what danger would do. But anyways, we did some bite work, gave danger the sleeve, told him to let go of the sleeve, he let go, and then we tried to end the session. So Carson said, okay, danger, come on, we gotta go. And danger said, I don't wanna go. I wanna stay here and do more bite work. So Carson pulled on him a little more with the, with the leash, just on a leash and a flat collar, I believe it was, and bang, danger just turned around and attacked him. So, you know, 40 stitches, right? Was it 40, 20? I don't remember. His arm was messed up. Um, and, and Danger did a number on him. So, you know, we got him off and put him in the kennel, so on and so forth. So now, what happens? I said, oh, man, are we not going to be able to do bite work with this dog anymore because we can't do any kind of control on him? We can't even take him away from the bite work when it's over, right? No, obviously, this is not something that's allowable. So what do we do? We bring danger out again, not the same day, of course. And this time my brother's handling him. I'm the decoy to do the bite work. And we're prepared. We have two lines on him. We've got a slip on him. And, and we set him up for it. Because again, we're not waiting to be ambushed. And of course he goes to do it because he had success the previous day. And remember, Dachis, Mallies, they're super pattern-based. Other dogs are pattern-based, but Dachis and Mallies, uh, Border Collies, the, these guys take pattern to another level. Once they do something and they're successful in it, whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, they will go back to that behavior like they've spent five years in school learning about it, right? So of course, he goes right back to it. And we created a big inhibition. It took a few repetitions because he was that kind of dog. But by the end of it, my brother was able to completely handle him in protection. No muzzle, nothing. Handle him in protection work doing things like barking next to the handler, right? So the dog's in a high state of arousal, going for the attack, out, recall to the handler, all that stuff, right? Because created inhibition about that behavior that he decided that he was going to do because he wanted something and there was frustration built up and he learned that he could redirect. And many working dogs do some, some, pro, some, some approximation of this, right? It's a very common thing that you see in a lot of uh, working dogs. So understanding that the context in which your dog is dangerous, setting yourself up to be successful in that context, figuring out what success looks like to you, you know, creating inhibition around those specific behaviors that you don't like or that are dangerous or unproductive, okay? And then filling that space that you've provided with alternate options for the dog. Remember, animals, nine times out of 10, will seek nine times, 9.99 times out of 10 
will always seek what's beneficial to them. They will always take the easiest way. Humans are the same, by the way. Okay? So when you're coming up with an effective training strategy, it needs to incorporate these things, right? Doesn't mean you won't make mistakes. Doesn't mean something bad can't happen. Maybe you have a moment of inattention. Maybe you miscalculate something. Doesn't mean that won't happen to me. It could. It's the game you play when you deal with dogs like this. Um, oh, one last thing I should probably talk about. So in our elite members group, Michelle, um, I know you've got this kind of, uh, this looks like he's a working line German Shepherd and um, you adopted him and you know, he's, he's uh, he, I guess recently he turned, because he, he, he attacks the handler. But I say attacks because from my understanding of your post, nobody ended up in the hospital. So for me, that's not really an attack. That's like maybe a warning. It could escalate to that. But if nobody's ended up in the hospital with severe puncture wounds, it wasn't really an attack. It was more of a, a warning, okay? Um, so anyways, the dog, I guess, if he doesn't like somebody leaving the area, he'll attack them from behind, family member, handler, whatever. Um, you know, and, and that's what I understand from what I saw of your post and, and what he does. So looking at the dog um, in the videos, I don't really see a dangerous dog there. Um, it's certainly a dog that maybe he could escalate to being truly dangerous. Um, there are certainly some disturbing behaviors that he's offering that do need to be addressed. But here's the thing. Right now, you know, you, you got this dog, what, a couple weeks ago? Already he's off leash walking around with you guys? Like, that's crazy. That's exactly an example. And I'm sorry, Michelle, to, to put you out there, but... Hey, no one knows who you are anyways, unless you comment on here. Um, the, uh, the, this is an example of not setting the playing field up. Oh, we've had two good weeks or three, even a month, right? Oh, let me trust him. Why would you trust him? This is a new dog. He doesn't know you. He doesn't know your family. You don't know him. You don't know all his little triggers and his little, uh, his little idiosyncrasies. There was no way that dog would, would be loose with no devices on him that I could use to correct him, control him, contain him, etc. Number two, why is he walking around? You've given this dog free access to resources. This dog is a dog you adopted because he has bad behaviors, behaviors that people de deem to be dangerous, behaviors that people deem to be, um, you know, so unacceptable they can no longer live with him. Why does this dog have free access to space, food, water, affection, all these things? He shouldn't. And it's not because we're being mean, it's because we're being smart and careful and we want to establish a new basis for new behavior and a new life with the dog, right? So if you just give him all these things freely, of course, you're setting up the situation so that all the context that leads to him being aggressive falls into place. And of course, he's going to become aggressive, as you found out. He did, right? Too much freedom too soon, not setting yourself up for success. And then when he offers the behavior, nothing bad really happening. Right now, I know a lot of people. I know you, Michelle. Maybe you think what you did was bad for him. Believe me, it wasn't. Right, and as I said in the group, for certain behaviors. So for me, with a behavior where a dog offers, if the dog offers this behavior, he's going to hurt somebody, right? Or maybe it's going to ultimately lead to him being put down. There's nothing I won't do to make him stop. Right? There's nothing I won't do to make him stop because it's it's his life or somebody else's basically. Right? That's how I look at it. And that allows me to do what's necessary to create real inhibition about the dog performing those behaviors again. We're not talking about something stupid like, oh, he jumps on people or something. I'm talking like real, like the dog's dangerous. He's going to hurt somebody. He's going to get himself put down. There's nothing I won't do to make him stop because ultimately it's a life. It's a life. It's somebody's health and safety. You know, listen, you get bit badly enough, um, you know, you can get infections. You can lose body parts. You can even die. It's, it's no joke. It's no joke to get bit, right? And, and you know, people, I think, oftentimes are a little bit dismissive of that, you know? God forbid a child gets bit or, or, or a small woman, you know? The, the results could be catastrophic. So these are things that, that I don't take lightly at all. Um, a lot of people, I find, they blur the line between negative reinforcement and punishment. So what you have to understand about negative reinforcement and punishment, negative reinforcement is aversive pressure okay aversive means uncomfortable undesirable okay that you apply to the dog right or to whatever it is that you're training person dog whale whatever okay that creates the 
behavior that you're looking for. So let's say I wanted uh, a dog to sit. So I pull up on his collar and he's uncomfortable and he sits and I stop pulling, okay? Now, depending on the dog, depending on the situation, I can pull a lot more, I can pull a lot less. Um, that actually brings me to another topic. I wanted to quickly talk about Ivan Balabanov, those of you, I'm sure some of you follow him, did this whole thing about how the seatbelt analogy is not correct as a way to describe negative reinforcement. It's a tangent. I'll get on that later because I completely disagree with him. Um, but anyways, suffice to say, you're making, you're making discomfort until the dog does the thing that you want, in which case you're removing the discomfort and giving the dog comfort, right? And that's basically negative reinforcement in a nutshell. So um, a lot of people think they're punishing a dog, but what they're really doing is negatively reinforcing the dog. So let's say I have a dog who's being aggressive, okay? He's, he's, he's leash reactive, whatever, okay? So I, I get within X distance of another dog and he becomes leash reactive and I say, no, and I give him a little pop on the leash and he stops. And he starts again and I say, no, and I give him a little pop on the leash and he stops. And we go through this a bunch of times, right? Am I punishing the dog, right? Am I punishing the dog? Like, let's say you don't see a lot of suppression in the body language. He stops though. I do the thing and he stops. I see this all the time. I see handlers doing this all the time. They think they're effectively punishing a behavior because the dog stops the behavior. But the dog will oftentimes go right back to the behavior, if not in the same instant, the next time he sees another dog. All you're doing in that circumstance is you're just creating enough pressure to stop the behavior. Maybe you're creating an alternate behavior with that pressure. So let's say you do it enough times, he kind of comes back to you and looks away from the other dog. All you're doing is you're negatively reinforcing him looking away from that dog. You're not actually positively punishing the behavior of being reactive. You understand? A lot of people don't really kind of grasp that line in the sand, so to speak. When you truly punish a behavior, you're going to see a couple of things. So let's say he does something like he's reactive. And I say no, and I actually punish him. However I punish him. Leash, e collar, bonker, whatever. Whatever you're using, whatever, you know, hand of God, whatever, right? I want to, I'm going to see a suppression in the body language that's very noticeable. Like you don't have to be a dog trainer to be like, oh yeah, that dog's suppressed. Because I've created a real aversive consequence to the behavior. The other thing that you're going to see is oftentimes the dog won't automatically go into another behavior. The dog will just kind of be like, you've just hit the reset button. He's just like, what the fuck? I don't know what to do, right? Because you haven't negatively reinforced him into another behavior. You've positively punished the expression of the specific behavioral contingency you're chasing. That's what people don't understand is most people think they're punishing a dog. Really what you're doing is you're just negatively reinforcing an alternate behavior and you're creating enough aversion that you're pushing the dog out of the undesirable behavior and into what you perceive as being desirable, whether it's a sit, whether it's a look at me, whether it's avoidance, whatever it is, right? A lot of people think, okay, you know, I correct him. He went to the other side and now he doesn't want to look at the other dog. So I've punished the behavior. In many cases you haven't. You've just negatively reinforced the dog moving away from the other dog and looking away from him. You haven't actually dealt with the problem and that's why he does it over and over and over again. When you effectively punish a behavior, you will see a reduction in the latency of that behavior. Okay, and ultimately, if, if you do it properly, uh, an extinction or enough of a reduction that it's almost an extinction that requires minimal levels of, of, of reapplication. Okay, again, that gives you a space. It, all it does, effective punishment only gives you a space in which now you can reintroduce uh, alternate programming. I'll give you an example of how this worked out well for me. And I like this example because this was an example of when things would go, when things go south in training, okay? So I had this girl um, and she brought, for one of my aggressive dog classes, she brought this dog de Bordeaux. So if you guys know what a dog de Bordeaux is, it's a big mastiff, okay? Female, dog aggressive, like really dog aggressive, not just like make noise dog aggressive, like, you know, wanted to eat another dog kind of dog aggressive. She wasn't kidding around, okay? So anyways, we went through a few weeks of training, the dog was doing well, um, you know, we created some real inhibition around the behavior that we found undesirable with her. Now, one of the things that I used to do 
and sometimes I still do it with my aggressive dog classes, is I'd stake out a dog who was, you know, uh, a little bit nasty on the back tie just to create a, kind of an obstacle, right? Something that people had to work around, another dog that's pulling and barking and being active towards their dogs and they have to keep their dog under control. So this was an exercise I did. So anyways, we went through all the dogs. She was last. Her dog starts to approach the dog that's on the tie out. The tie out breaks and that dog ran right towards her, right? Now, I wasn't using a really aggressive dog in that circle, not a dog aggressive dog, but you know, he was a bit of a jerk, that's all, right? So he ran right up to her. And normally she would have just pounced on him and that would have been that, right? He smelled her and she just froze and sat in that sit, right? And there was like maybe three seconds, three seconds before I got to them and I got that dog away. And that initial inhibition that we created that caused that fr that freezing behavior gave the handler enough time to collect her dog and prevent the dog from doing anything more than, you know, just kind of, holy crap, there's a dog here and what the hell, that wasn't expecting that, right? Because there was real inhibition. If there wasn't inhibition, she would have attacked that other dog right away and we would have had some vet bills. So that's an example of, of why it's important. You create real inhibition. You create it. It's going to give you that breathing space to do what needs to be done or it can actually save your ass depending on the circumstance that you're, you're dealing with. So I think the biggest thing a lot of people do, and I would say the biggest mistake most people make with dogs that are capable of being dangerous, there's obviously a genetic component to dogs being dangerous. So to some degree, right, to some degree, if you know that you have a dog that has that proclivity, I would never 100% trust it. Never. I would know that there are certain things that could fall into place that could elicit that aggressive behavior again. And a lot of people, they're so quick. It's like, oh, it's been a couple of good weeks. I tr trust them. I've seen professional trainers do this. And next thing you know, they're in the hospital. Don't trust these. Don't trust the dog. Always set yourself up for success. I don't care how well things have been going. You know, keep doing what you're doing that's leading to the success. Don't just... Oh, well, things are good now. I can relax, right? Obviously, you're not going to be on high alert all the time. But you're certainly not going to completely remove all the precautions that you're taking, right? There are some dogs, like I said, there are some dogs that are truly dangerous in certain circumstances. That danger, in my opinion, there's if it happened a few times or once even, there's always the potential it could happen again. You should always be prepared. And if you're always prepared, you know, I, I, I think that much less likely something bad will happen. So that's my little spiel on, on, on training dangerous dogs and, and what I think of that process. Um, you know, again, I'm, I'm filming what I'm doing with the Dutchie. He's a dog I think that's capable of being dangerous under specific circumstances. You know, I don't really know him 100% yet. It'll be interesting training with him. Like he certainly had some kennel aggression. That doesn't necessarily mean... Um, you know, 100% that he's a nasty dog, but also he's the type of dog that has the intensity and then, of course, the breed type, so on and so forth. It'll be interesting once we start to do more high-intensity kind of training, bite work, you know, obedience with toys, so on and so forth, what kind of dog he is there and how he reacts to pressure and to control, right? Because there's many dogs that when you let them do whatever they want to do, no problemo. The second you say, okay, now there's rules, man. You got to listen to me, Right? That's when the problems begin to occur. So I have a process too that I do with working dogs that's very specific to them for how I train them in the obedience. Um, because the problem with working dogs, again, is arousal. So a lot of people say, oh my God, he's dangerous. When he becomes aroused, he redirects on the handler. He does all these types of things. So the solution is to suppress him. And I've seen that a lot, you know, with the dog's like healing with his tail between his legs because that's the only way they could figure out how to make him safe. But you don't have to actually do that. Uh, not... Not for the vast majority of them, right? You can you could take some pretty nasty dogs that, that have some pretty bad behaviors in the protection and the obedience, and you can create some really nice obedience and, and nice control on the dog with certain things that I like to do with those types of dogs that prevent the handler or make it less likely anyways that the handler is going to get bit, allow you to introduce the concept of pressure to the dog in a productive way and um, allow you to actually get 
start to polish that diamond a little bit and get the best out of the dog. So I think that's uh, that's my spiel on on training dangerous dogs and and what's involved there. Let's see here. So I know there's a lot of you have been commenting. A lot of comments. God damn. Sorry, guys. I did stop reading from the comments from the moment I uh, started talking about dealing with the reactive dogs. So uh, I'm going to try and kind of skim everything. And sorry if uh, I miss you. Da -da -da -da. Okay. Let's see here. Okay, so Melody, quick question. My six-month-old German Shepherd is wanting to play with my older dog, but my older dog is clearly annoyed. Yeah, it's very common. Don't let your puppy harass your older dog. It's not setting the standard for a, a good uh, relationship. Puppies should not be allowed to harass um, the older dogs that live in the house. How do I uh, join the Elite Shield Canine group? Uh, well, you gotta be in one of our online courses, and then once you're in the online course, uh, you would have been sent an email with a link to the group. Much respect from Southern California from EDG Lopez. Thanks, my friend. I appreciate that. Uh, when you assess a dog for personal protection training suitability, what would be reasons of rejecting it from your protection program? Um, instability. Uh, if I see like excessive nervousness, um, if the dog has a lot of handler issues, especially if the handler is like somewhat inexperienced, that type of thing. Um, is Mace warming up yet or still showing teeth uh, through the kennel? He's warming up. He, he's not 95% of the time he's happy to see me. Glad to be part of the group. Looking forward to seeing Jerry. Oh, yes, Keith. Yeah, Keith is, is uh, coming up to pick up Jerry. He's my, Jerry's a Vasco son. So, you know, uh, Vasco is case in point. You know, guys, you guys know Carson's handling get Vasco. Uh, even though Jerry appears to be uh, nothing like his daddy from a, a nasty standpoint, um, uh, you know, obviously for Vasco to be the way he is, he's also a, a, a pretty confident and strong dog. Jerry's his uh, pop, a puppy from Vasco. He's, what, 10, 12 weeks old, something like this. Um, yeah, so Keith, I think you're going to really like Jerry. Okay. Catahoula X Lab, Catahoula dogs. It's always the Catahoulas, you know. It seems like not a particularly good dog to keep as a pet. Uh, Catahoula made huge process, progress with resource guarding. Will drop, come, and sit away from the item. If asleep, he will still bite. I put food in his dish and he woke up and bit me. <laughs> what? Shana, why are you feeding a sleeping dog? And why is he sleeping loose? This is case in point about what I'm talking about. Stop leaving the dangerous dog loose. And uh, I certainly would not feed a sleeping dog. My dogs are well aware that they're being fed. They come downstairs, they lie down. I go to the bowls, I take the bowls, they wait there, I fill the bowls, I put them down, I say each dog's name, they go to the bowl and they eat. And it's gone in two minutes, right? So this is exactly case in point what I'm talking about. Um, all right, let's see. My eight-month-old German Shepherd is so reactive from far away. Do you think getting closer will fix the issue? No, it won't. Take my reactive course and take my elite off-leash course. That will fix the issue if you have um, a basic level of competence. Hello from Indonesia. Hello, my friend. How are you? Um, I would love your thoughts on managing two female German Shepherds who want to dominate each other on a constant basis besides separation of the yard. Yeah, when you get dogs that are showing same-sex aggression, I mean, dominate each other can mean a lot of different things, right? Um, it can mean simply they're just playing with each other, and you know, there's a little bit of a, 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 a rivalry, but it's nothing serious, or it can mean like they're trying to kill each other. So it's one of those things where, um, you know, uh, I never allow them to, so like I was just walking my two German Shepherd males today, I was walking Yaxi and Gage together in the woods, and I know Gage is the problem causer of the two, he has a very low threshold, to go into a high state of arousal and he also has some certain jerk tendencies that he gets from uh, uh, both the mother and the father line and um you know so gage is uh you know the one who's probably going to cause the problem so certain things i don't ever allow them to do 
I never allow them to compete for resources. If Gage picks up a stick, I tell him to drop the stick. If Yaxi picks up a leaf and wants to carry that around, I tell him to drop the leaf. They're not going to compete for, for resources, and resources can literally be a stick or a leaf. Um, things like, uh, you know, rough play with each other. I never allow it because for them, rough play will turn into something different, right? You have to, you have to understand these things and, and limit the potential for that behavior and keep the dogs always in a lower to medium state of arousal around one another. Um, hey, Hass, I have a four-month Rottweiler. When can I start adding frustration to him on the back tie? If you're taking my online um, course, ask this question in the group and post a video of your dog. Um, question, my parents have a pug that urinates all over the property and does it multiple times. We've tried showing him where to go. Potty, corrections, taking him for walks, but still the behavior. I mean, if it's all over your, your property, uh, what I would do is I would create a delineated area in the yard, okay? Whether you leave the grass longer there or whatever, it, it should look very different, okay? It would be like a corner or something. And then what I would do is I would take him there and uh, I would constantly uh, reward him. You have to take him on the leash and you have to put the time in. And whenever he goes there, I would reward him. And then whenever he goes to the bathroom there, I would reward him. So you have to understand this, like it's, it's, it's a process if you want the dog to go in one specific place on your property. Uh, you know, uh, it's one of those things where even if I'm gonna put him out by himself, the way I would set it up is once I've done it a bit on the leash, I would actually leave treats in the grass there. So he would go there and he would eat in the grass and you know, he would always have a, an association with going to that place. Onyx here from the USA. This is from Pilot Kisses, who is uh, the new owner of Onyx, or not the new owner anymore. I see some of you guys saying, I am blurry. Sorry, guys. I don't look blurry to myself. Uh, let's see here. Agreed. My pit killed my other dogs when I wasn't around on a stormy night, and they had grown up together. It's the sad reality of those dogs, you know. People love them for how they look and for how they act, because oftentimes with the handlers, these dogs are very sweet, and I've dealt with the piece that I've absolutely loved. I would not live with one, um, no matter how cute and cuddly it was, and nor would I allow it around my family. Unfortunately, you know, I I I have small children. It's just not worth it. Um, you know, but I do love them. Like, I like training them. I just, there's certain things about them where I know what's in the lines. I don't, I, I can't guarantee that it's not in the dogs, in that specific dog's line, right? And, and that's the problem. Okay. Help me stop my one-year-old working line, Shepard. Uh, Stop barking, everything or someone. Take my uh, lead off leash course, that will help you. I have a Great Dane I can hardly afford to feed. I am a freelance dog groomer. I don't make a lot of money. I just need to know how to help his reactive behavior. He is danger, bit two dogs. Well, uh, I would say if you're a pet dog groomer, that is a good business to be in. How can you how can you not be making too much money that's a high demand business they can't find pet dog groomers <laughs> um, so uh, that, that's one thing the other thing I would say is uh, yeah you need to get yourself some professional training or you know probably again the cheapest options my online course it's not something I can just tell you how to do on a on a live here um, let's see. Sorry, guys, I'm just skimming, right? Because, like, I can't read every one of these. Remember the presses that mauled that woman in San Francisco? Yeah, but that was, like, what was that? Like, in the in the 90s or something? There was two presses. They, like, killed a woman in an elevator. Um, I don't think she was the owner. It's less common with them, right? Again, there's a lot less of them. But the, the reality is, you know, look, there's huskies that have killed babies, right? Like, there's other dogs, for sure, that have killed, have killed people or severely injured them. It's just unfortunately, with the pitties and the pit bulls, there are certain breed characteristics that 
when they attack, generally it's not a small attack, and 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 the damage that they can do is 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 extraordinary. Let's see here. Um, my sound's getting live. I, I hope, I hope my sound uh, is still good. I'm, I'm still behind on the comments. So if my sound, my sound is bad, drop one in, and I'll check in the bottom in, in like a minute. Yeah, well, Michelle, I see Michelle wrote, so I have gotten steel to stop redirecting on me, and he shows that he's thinking and making the choice not to redirect on me through huge corrections, but he isn't generalizing that with other people. Well, there are certain types of dogs that are simply not for other people to handle. Like, once I get Mace under control, well, me and Hef are actually training Mace. Once me and Hef get Mace under control, that's not going to be a dog that we just tell anyone to take out of the kennel, Right. First, you must make success with you, and after you, maybe you can try your partner, and then so on and so forth. I had a canine from Lyon County redirect on the handler three times, and the handler lost all three fights. So I got the dog from him and did some work with him and sent him to a different agency. He's doing good. Good. That's the good thing about Mally's is, you know, sometimes if you fix a problem, it stays fixed. Uh, let's see here. Don't put your Great Dane to sleep. Find someone that wants one. I'm pretty sure there's like Great Dane rescues and so on and so forth. If he's like every other Great Dane I've ever trained, it's not too bad. Don't worry. Um, a lot of back and forth in the comments, guys, which is fine. I'm just trying to find the ones that I need to address. Um, um, uh, Michelle saying she had the dog for six weeks. Still wouldn't trust him. Wouldn't trust him. Oh, Michelle, I wouldn't put that in the comments. I'm not going to read that. <laughs> it's still social media. You know, you got to be careful. There's some things you can't say. Um, someone, Maddie, you're saying you're getting problems with the server, uh, but I have a good internet connection and other people on here seem okay. She's reactive at anything that moves towards the handler. She's my fourth Malwa. The other trainer couldn't handle her. Um, well, take my reactive course. You'll probably find a lot of uh, success doing what we do in there. Zachariah says, that is a great explanation of how most people think they are using negative punishment Positive punishment, but really they are using negative reinforcement. Yeah, it's very misunderstood. <laughs> Maddie goes, can you do a lake tag and a yika tag? I miss my Ambudas. Uh, this is going to be a primarily a peacock tank, actually. So I moved all my Oscars, for those of you wondering. Uh, I'm a bit of a fish nerd now. I moved all my Oscars downstairs. So I used to have like the whole, the whole river basin kind of deal going on in here. I ripped it apart completely. I moved all my Oscars down to the basement, and uh, I'm moving all my peacocks up here. But because I'm not a purist, I have peac I have uh, I have Lake Tonkahana. I have uh, I can't remember the other lakes. 
be honest with you. But I got peacocks. Um, I got, I think, some haps. Uh, I got some ambunas. So I, I got some different stuff in there. Anything that's colorful that I like the look of is going in the tank, basically. Uh, guys, what can I do when my puppy Melwa is barking, growling, even nipping at me to get my attention? Well, if you're ignoring her, why is she loose to do that? You know, control, com contain your puppy. Put, put your puppy away. And if your puppy's loose and doing that kind of thing, give her negative attention, not positive attention. That's, that's what I would say to you. I have a YouTube video completely free on how to deal with nipping puppies. Did we find out what was wrong with Vasco? Um, as far as we can find out, we found out there was nothing physically wrong with him. Um, he's doing, he's actually, so it's funny because, you know, we were just training with him today and, and he was like full of activity today. And, um, you know, Carson was telling me that he had a bitch in heat at his place and uh, Vasco was like full a-hole again because he's frustrated because he, he wasn't able obviously to breed. Um, <laughs> so of course he's at a high state of frustration and he's very active believe me i saw him in training today i think uh there were some things that were done in the secondary obedience um that uh, were not productive and you know like i said uh, carson and i were training with some different folks and and some of the things that they were doing i think again i'm not blaming them i'm just saying like obviously they didn't, they didn't know the dog the way we knew the dog um, and it was kind of counterproductive to what we were doing. So whatever, whatever. Bottom line, I think he's looking a lot better now. How strong of a correction can you give a GSD puppy under one year? I feel like my pup is, as you described, where there is a correction for a moment. But he continues. I can't, I can't quantify that to you on a live. I don't know you. I don't know your dog. Go find a professional trainer is, is what my advice would be. But at the end of the day, when I correct the dog, obviously I don't want to injure the dog in any capacity. If that's a possibility, I don't want to do it. Um, but I need to see that, obviously, that I punish the dog. There's a clear, uh, non-questionable result where I can see in the body language of the dog that he perceived what happened as extremely aversive and does not want it to be repeated. Um, how do I deal with puppy tantrums? I laugh at them and give them kisses and cuddles. It's not a problem for me. It's a puppy. Just like a child, you know, like a two-year-old, three-year-old child. Um, sorry, guys, just going through all of this. So, no blurry. Very interesting discretion. Green collar has good environmentals and nice full grips. I'm, here, I'm happy to hear that, Ty. I have no doubt that he's going to turn into one hell of a dog. Did I already show my fish? So, if you guys follow me at um, on my personal uh, YouTube channel, this is, like, this is like the Shield Canine YouTube channel. Um, I actually have a personal YouTube channel called Has Offman. Um, here, I'll write it in the chat. And um, you guys can, uh, you guys can, uh, I don't know if I can write it actually in the chat. No, I can't. Never mind. Or I don't know how. Bottom line, has H-A-Z dot O-T-H-M-A-N, Othman. Um, I have like my horses and my fish in there. And, you know, that's, that's kind of where I do my stuff. It's not dog related. Off topic, what are your thoughts on people using service assistant dogs as well as IPO or buy sports? Do you think it conflicts with the two different jobs? No, because IPO is a sport. So it doesn't really have an impact on, on you know, a service dog. <laughs> Do you plan to have more German Shepherd litter soon? Yeah, I'm waiting for a couple of females to go into heat.
elite member. Hey, has just started going through your course on terminal versus continuation markers. Seen some traders food reward on continuation and terminal chip to teach the dog the two. What are your thoughts on that technique? Well, I do that. If I say good, doesn't mean I can't feed the dog. And if I say chip, I'll feed the dog, but he's allowed to get up. Right? That has maybe, I think you're talking about Vasco. Vasco has low testosterone. He doesn't. <laughs> That's not his problem. He's got pro. He If he has problems, that is not one. He does not have low testosterone. Oh, God, no. Um, can you do a video geared to pit bulls? I did. I have a video where I talk about pit bulls. And I also have videos where, um, you know, you see me training like a, you see us training some bullies, so. <laughs> you should do a branch of shield canine that boards dobies to get docked and cropped. So yeah, like for those of you that don't know, my Instagram was temporarily banned because um, I posted a video of a client's dog actually that had recently had its ears cropped and his ears were wrapped up in the those wraps. And um, I guess people got mad and assumed I had cropped his ears. Not that I have a problem doing it. like, well, I wouldn't personally do it, but that I would have a problem taking him to the vet to get his ears cropped. And they like mass reported me and my Instagram page got taken down, but it's back up. Uh, for me with Instagram, you know, I will say this, like Instagram has some very, very silly rules, let's say. Um, and I've decided, you know, I thought about it because our Instagram page is actually doing well lately, but I've decided, you know, like I was thinking even about posting this video recently. Like I just did a little video doing some bite work with um, one of the German Shepherds, like some just IGP guarding and stuff like this. And I said, you know, um, if I post this video, it might get mass reported by these types of people. Because again, the more, obviously the more people that follow your page, the more idiots you also get. It's just a fact of life. Um, and I said, man, if I post this video, this, this stuff could be misconstrued and I could, you know, I could... Uh, get mass report again. Then I said, you know what? Who cares? If I can't post videos like this, I don't want to be on the platform anyway. So what are your thoughts on rescue and adoption of older dogs? Well, a lot of the experience I got is from training older dogs. It's completely different than when you train a puppy, obviously, right? So my last two competition dogs prior to Gage, I got Onyx when he was like three and a half. And um, I got Bastion, um, who was, there was one dog between Onyx and Bastion, but I got Bastion when he was like three. So these are dogs that had previous, let's say, history, things that were good and things that were bad, um, you know, and uh, I had to take them and train them. And these were not low drive dogs. I had to train them into being a dog that could do productive and useful things on the trial field. And... Um, you know, that it was no small challenge. I think it's much easier actually to raise and train a puppy than it is to take an adult dog that has some, you know, bad training and fix the bad training. I think it's much easier to take now that I've done it both different ways, right? Taking muzzle off my dog, she growls at me. What should I do? Um, well, if my dog's looking at me and growling at me, he's threatening me, right? That's, that's it at the end of the day. So if your dog threatens you, for me, it's the same as if your dog's being aggressive towards you. And what you should do is pretty simple. Set yourself up for success and make sure that the dog is not successful in threatening you. Um, Rosie has had social anxiety since I rescued her off of Craigslist at six weeks old. It's been six years and so no improvement. Take her through the training program. Make sure she can do everything, um, you know. And, uh, of course, you're not going to change genetics. You're not going to change the, the fundamental nature of who the dog is. You just change how the dog copes with those feelings, right? Callum, my staffy pit bull mix has never shown aggression at nine months 
watching this live has made me think to get rid of her as I have. Uh, I don't, I don't, Callum. I'm not going to tell you to do that. Obviously, look. Hundreds of thousands of pit bulls or bully type dogs grow up around families and are completely safe. Here's what I would say. Don't leave the dog unsupervised with the kids. That's it. That's it. You know, just don't leave the dog unsupervised with the kids. If you guys, if the kids are playing downstairs or something, just put the dog away. You know, I don't want people getting rid of their dogs or anything like that. You know, like I said, I've trained a lot of bullies and pities and I like them. I like them. It's not, you know, I'm not saying that, that your dog for sure has that in inside of her. Just be safe. And I would say that with any large dog, you know, like Gage, I don't leave my ba my babies with Gage. I don't. That's a bad idea. Why would I do that? You know what I mean? Like, if I'm here, it's okay if they're tooling around and I don't let them bother him. But they're obviously sharing the same space. But if I'm not downstairs or I'm not wherever he is, guess what? He doesn't have free access to my little children, right? It's, it's just smart. What's the site to register for training? Shieldk9.ca. No, I won't fall in love with the Dachi breed. Believe me, I will. I know I won't. <laughs> uh, do I have a favorite dog? My favorite dog was a Chihuahua named Rambo. Followed shortly by my first German Shepherd. Her name was Kayla. She was a long-haired dog that I got at, at the Humane Society. I loved the, both those dogs a lot. Probably more than I loved any other dogs um, that I've had. Never thought it could be inherited. Everything's inherited. Every proclivity your dog has is inherited. Dogs don't just decide to be, um, you know, to resource guard or to not trust people. You can get a social stable dog and, um, you know, it can have a bad thing happen to it and it doesn't just automatically distrust humans, right? This is a misconception everybody has. Every predisposition your dog has from social anxiety to aggressive behavior to resource guarding is 100% has a hereditary component. It does. And, and to a greater degree, a hereditary component. I've seen many puppies show resource guarding behaviors or insecurity around strange people and strange dogs as early as six weeks of age, right? It is not abnormal to see it five weeks. Elite, an actual question for you. Can you tell me how to confirm odor alerts? My migraine alerts, and it's really hard for me to know if I'm getting one or not because of how they present. How to confirm odor alerts. It's like your dog alerts you to migraines. I mean, you should know your dog's uh, alert behavior, right? So if your dog's alerting to migraines or dope or whatever it is, part of the training is you learn your dog's tell, your dog's alert, right? And then, you know, of course, you reward the dog for appropriately alerting you. I am not a detection expert. It is actually the one area of dog training that has not overly interested me like i understand the basics of it and i've done a little bit of it but i'm definitely not what i would call an expert in detection work um let's see No problem, Callum. Just don't get, don't don't just frivolously get rid of your dog. You know, here's the thing about dogs, guys. You know, as much as there's challenges associated with with owning them, especially some of them, it's a life. You know what I mean? Like it's a life, and and you know you've got to you've got to give that the honor that that it is due. I I truly believe. You know, there is. Um, you you are truly responsible for 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 these animals that completely depend on you and it's not their fault even the nastiest dogs i've run into it's not their fault it's not they're just wired that way you know they're wired that way you know it's they didn't ask to be born that way that's the way they were born and in some cases unfortunately 
you know, their continued life represents too much of a danger to the health and safety of the community that it is best for them um, to be put down, but it's still not their fault. And it's a truly sad thing to watch a dog take its last breath. So you have to, you have to honor that life and you have to take that, that responsibility seriously. Uh, you know, when they come with you, it's just funny because like I was telling my wife recently, um, like you guys know my new dog, Yaxi, if you follow me. Um, like I like my new dog, Yaxi, more than Gage, to be honest with you. I think he's a better dog in many ways. Um, I think he's a more stable and easy dog in many ways. He's a nicer dog from a competition standpoint. I like him a lot. Um, and, you know, I was like, well, you know, I'd like to have him maybe in the house, but the problem is Gage is in the house and Gage grew up in my house and so on and so forth. Uh, and, you know, yeah, actually I imported when he was a year, less than, a little less than a year old, 10 months. But as I said, you know, unless I actually develop a real safety concern with, with, with my dog Gage, he has to stay in the house. He grew up here. You know what I mean? I don't want him to be upset if he goes to the kennel. And obviously I'm not keeping two males in the house. That's, I just don't have the time and the energy for that, right? Certain types of males, I always say, if I, if I had two yaksies, it wouldn't be a problem. You know, two gauges, that's a problem. Gauge with any other male, it's, it's just a matter of time. <laughs> so, you know what I mean? But you, you, regardless of, of the dog, it's not his fault. You know what I mean? You have to, you have to take that into consideration. Do you really find a difference in males and duchies, or is it the lions rather than the breeds? Of course, it's the lions. You know, there are some litters where they're, they've got some stripy dogs and some yellow dogs in the same litter. For sure, it's the lions, but I find a lot of the duchies I've dealt with have a lot of handler issues, which is the big problem with them, right? When you're training a PPD and socializing them to the public, how do you balance letting the dog being attentive to the public and his surroundings, but maintaining focus on you? Um, when I ask the dog to do something, he's expected to do it. That's it at the bottom, at the end of the day, right? Well, the problem with alerts and this is a problem that a lot of people in detection deal with is false alerting. So the second the dog realizes, hey, if I do this, I'm going to be rewarded, and the dog gets away maybe with a false alert or two, it could be, uh, it could be a problem, right? So that's the challenge when you're doing detection work, is, is, is setting up scenarios so that the dog does not false alert. The problem is, I mean, how do you set up and reward the dog for for the, the desirable behavior when you're compromised mentally and physically when it's about to occur. That's the whole problem with that type of training, which is why, to be honest, I don't trust it. I have a 28 pound, 15 week old German Shepherd Husky mix. She can get scared easily and will run back towards the house when I try to take her on a walk. I keep on pushing her through this with the walk. Yeah, it's good. Teach her to deal with the world. My cadaver dog will false alert if he feels he is going to get his toy. Hard to stop sometimes. Well, this one, this instance, you can set this up, right? You can deal with that. I'm not, again, I'm not an expert on detection. I'll leave that to the experts to talk about. But for things, obviously, you have access to cadaver odor and you can set the dog up for a false alert and deal with that appropriately um i'm neuter will neutering my german shepherd make him less aggressive will he lose his prey to engage uh it's not going to help you i've never seen like most of the dogs that i deal with for behavioral issues are neutered so if neutering was a panacea to fix these problems then you wouldn't see a, a lower instance you would see a significantly lower instance of negative and aggressive behaviors in neutered dogs, whereas we actually see the opposite. All right, guys, I'm going to wrap it up. Thank you all for joining me on this live. Check out our online training programs, shieldk9.ca. Uh, stay tuned on this channel and on our Instagram for more news. Uh, we got a lot of things in the works. We're really, really excited. Uh, I appreciate you guys for all, all of you guys for tuning in. Uh, I hope you guys took some value from this. And, uh, you know, remember, at the end of the day, you know, these dogs, these dogs are, 
they deserve they deserve the best we can give them. So um, let's let's look at look look at it from that standpoint. Even when we're talking about things like aggression and, and dogs putting people in the hospital, so on and so forth. All right, guys, you have a nice day.